Okay, well, welcome everybody uh, to tonight's uh, American Sheep Industry Association webinar on a new approach to uh, parasite management in sheep. My name is Jay Parsons. I'm your host and moderator, and I'm glad to uh, welcome our uh, presenters this evening, Dr. Will Getz and Dr. Tom Terrell from Fort Valley State University down in uh, southern Georgia, two well-known experts uh, in this uh, area of parasite management and small ruminants. Um, I'd st like to start by thanking the American Sheep Industry Association and the Rebuild the Sheep Inventory Committee for providing funding for this evening's uh, presentation and let you all know that uh, the presentation is being recorded and will be available for later viewing. Um, you will be receiving an email with a link to that recording uh, as well as a link will be uh, posted on the American Sheep Industry Association website that's, uh, at sheepusa.org. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the uh, microphone over to our speakers, and I believe Dr. Getz is going to go first, and I hope you enjoy this evening's uh, webinar. Well, thank you, Jay. Uh, this is Will, and uh, beside me here is uh, Tom Terrell. We uh, appreciate this opportunity to uh, visit with uh, everyone about the uh, new approach to uh, parasite management and appreciate ASI for making uh, this opportunity uh, available. Uh, in the interest of uh, transparency and uh, uh, we need to uh, share that uh, neither of us are parasitologists uh, nor are we veterinarians. However, we've invested uh, the last 15 years in intensive study research as well as uh, uh, training uh, on the issues related to internal parasite uh, resistance and management in sheep. should also uh, indicate that uh, many of the things that we will mention uh, this evening will apply to goats, and so those of the uh, audience who have sheep and goats can take this message uh, away for the goats as well. This has been a collaborative effort and uh, over the last uh, uh, 15 years or so, there have been a number of institutions who have uh, worked together to um, provide uh, some of the new information. The American Consortium for Small, Small Ruminant Parasite Control is the name of that particular group these days. Several topics that we're going to try to cover this evening, and we're going to move through this uh, rel relatively rapidly. We know that there will be some discussion and questions uh, later on. But we want to uh, define the problem, uh, visit a little bit about uh, the parasites, uh, what we know about them and how they operate, uh, some of the biological issues related to gastrointestinal parasites, a very quick uh, review of some of the dewormers uh, that are available and where we've come in terms of uh, dewormers and then what we can do about uh, the challenges that we have in terms of being more wise in our uh, deworming uh, practices, uh, utilizing uh, the uh, FAMACHA card, which is a tool for diagnosis, and then some alternative controls that uh, we suggest are out there and, and available. Well, obviously the big problem and what we want to focus on tonight is the issue of anthematic uh, resistance which is essentially a worldwide problem, not just in the United States. And uh, we've come to realize that it's not even just the uh, southern United States. Uh, we've, been, uh, we've had conversations with people uh, as far north, north as Canada where some of these issues uh, have come up. And it's not only a resistance to uh, single uh, drugs, but to uh, several drugs um, at the same time. This means that uh, our options uh, rapidly become less as we move through uh, the, uh, the matter. Well, we need to define uh, uh, resistance, and uh, we're talking about resistance uh, in the worms themselves. Later on, we'll talk about uh, resistance to worms by the host, which in this case is the sheep. Um, but uh, for the most part, when we talk about resistance in our discussion tonight, it's going to have to do with the worms. And, Resistance is simply the ability of certain worms in a population to survive the treatments with dewormers that normally would be effective in terms of killing 
that particular worm species at that particular stage of in infection. Now, there's underlying uh, genetic reasons for this and caused by changes in uh, uh, the uh, level or the frequency of resistance genes carried by the worms in a population. We'll say a little bit more about that in a little bit later. Uh, a little bit of history, I think, is worth considering because where we are today is a reflection of where we've come in the past and some of the things that we either did or we didn't do in the past. If we look at uh, when uh, the uh, modern uh, dewormers, the chemical dewormers, uh, really became uh, available, many of you, uh, or at least some of you in the audience, may remember phenothiazine back in the 1940s and 50s, which was uh, became the drug of, of choice before that time. Uh, did not really have sophisticated dewormers, but uh, phenothiazine was really the first effective, uh, cheap, safe. Uh, dewormer, and it was effective for about 20 years. And uh, followed by uh, uh, thibendazole, which uh, some of you may remember from about the 60s until the 80s, uh, was also fairly, um, fairly effective. But what we ended up doing was to become uh, over-reliant on those dewormers, and we forgot about management, and it was oftentimes uh, easier simply deworm the whole herd, deworm every animal and do it on a time basis. Uh, whenever the uh, old drug uh, became uh, less effective, there was a new one on the market. We're now at the point where we don't have any new drugs available to us, and so whatever we have is what we have, and we have to make uh, some wise choices in how to, to deal with that particular thing. All right. So where do resistant worms come from? Well, essentially they've been there all along. <clears throat> and they've been, on, they've been there all along uh, and um, uh, develop um, because of the fact that we do um, challenge them with uh, dewormers. Uh, those worms that are not resistant uh, die off and those that are resistant are responsible for the next generation. And so they've been there all along and that's the reason why our dewormers uh, have become less effective. And whenever we introduce a new dewormer, then it requires a different kind of genetic composition on the worms themselves. So there's really nothing uh, new. Uh, and uh, what we need to do from the standpoint of management is to make sure that they don't continue to uh, develop, uh, develop. It's essentially a gene frequency thing. Um, on this next slide, you'll see that uh, we talk about genes for resistant. Uh, generally, we uh, presume that there are multiple genes, many genes involved, each one having some level of uh, effect on resistance. Those effects are additive. And if we look at a whole population of worms, there will be within that population worms that have a high frequency of these resistant genes. Uh, number that have low frequency, and those are the ones that we kill. And every time we deworm, we're selecting for those worms that have a high frequency of genes that are providing resistance. This next illustration, I think, does a good job. It is oversimplified, and we'll talk about some of the exceptions here in just a moment. But if we have a, a population of worms and a flock of sheep on the left-hand side of that screen, you'll see that some of them could be classified as being susceptible. Uh, they have a relatively low frequency of genes that provide resistance. And then we have a certain portion of that flock, a certain portion of that worm population that has a high frequency of the genes for resistance. Every time we deworm, then we're going to kill off those susceptible uh, worms. And the ones that remain are responsible for the next generation. Now, there will be a few of those susceptible ones that don't die, and they, they are worms that are either out on the pasture in the form of larva, or they happen to be in some sheep that don't get dewormed. Uh, they will um, also reproduce and dilute the effect of the resistant um, worms. And so even though um, next generations will be predominantly resistant, it won't be quite as drastic as uh, 
illustration shows, but the principle remains. Now, uh, just uh, so that we understand what's really going on, um, whenever we look at what happens in terms of the frequency of resistant genes in the population, and you look at this chart here and you look over on the left-hand side there, the frequency of resistant worms is relatively low. And we could say, for example, perhaps one or two worms out of a million might be classified as resistant. But worms reproduce relatively rapidly in every generation that, that situation changes uh, imperceptibly in the beginning until uh, we reach a critical level and then it increases uh, fairly rapidly. I think in the uh, uh, next slide, uh, you'll see here that uh, there will have been several generations passed before we can even detect uh, resistance with laboratory tests, and then even further before we actually see the situation as a clinical problem where we begin to see cases of uh, uh, bottle jaw or uh, anemia those kind of things. At this point, it's really too late to reverse the situation, and we have essentially developed a resistant population that's not going to change. Resistance is uh, forever, as this uh, slide suggests. So it is an important issue, and when we reach that point, and if we don't have uh, other options, we're in big, big trouble. Now I'm going to turn it over for um, further discussion, the next uh, area to uh, Dr. Terrell here, and so Tom will visit with you about the next several issues that uh, are of importance. Uh, so what, what is needed is a fresh approach, and um, about 10, 11 years ago, a group came together called the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. Uh, it was originally called the Southern Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. And it's uh, scientists and extension people and veterinarians and even some farmers from all of these uh, different institutions uh, from all across the southern United States, uh, also Puerto Rico and, and um, the Virgin Islands and, and South Africa, and uh, originally in Denmark as well. But uh, um, if you want to get a little more information, we have a website called uh, uh, acsrpc.org where essentially this, this presentation and just a lot of other information on sustainable parasite control information is available. Some of the projects uh, that, that the ACSRPC has been uh, working on over the years, um, one is was to take the FAMACHA card, which was developed in South Africa for sheep, and uh, validate it for use in sheep and goats here in the U.S. Uh, we've done some tests with, with using copper oxide wire boluses as an uh, anti-parasitic um, treatment. Uh, also, quite a bit of research on use of condensed tannin containing forages um, for their anti-parasitic effects. Uh, we're doing some research and encouraging farmers to use integrated management approaches. Um, some work with, with uh, resistance in the host, uh, in sheep and also in goats. And we started off doing some work with, with uh, nematode trapping fungi and vaccines, and I'll go through each one of these things a little bit, but uh, um, the last two are, uh, we haven't developed quite as far along. So I wanted to start with just giving an idea of what, what the actual problem is, which parasites that we're interested in for sheep, and all of these also apply to goats. Uh, the most important species are Humuncus contortus, which is also known as the barber pole worm or the wire worm or the blood worm uh, has a lot of different names. Uh, this is a uh, worm that occurs in the abomasum is a blood feeding worm. Uh, another one that occurs in the abomasum is the uh, Telodorsagia circumstincta, which is a brown stomach worm. Um, Trichostrongulus glubriformis, also known as the bankrupt worm, occurs in the uh, small intestine. And as you get further down the digestive tract, you can have some uh, nematodirus. By far and away, the biggest problem uh, here in the southern U.S. and actually throughout most of the tropics and subtropics of the world is, 
is a worm called Humongous contortus or the barber pole worm. It's public enemy number one for sheep. It is, as the slide says, literally a blood-sucking worm. And the problem is that uh, it is very prolific. Uh, one female can, can produce 5,000 eggs per day. It has an extremely short life cycle, uh, two and a half to three weeks from the time of an adult until the eggs are, are um, produced and larvae are produced and then you, uh, growing back into a, to adults again. And this worm preys on weak, uh, really any kind of animal that's under stress, and um, the animal essentially bleeds to death. And so it's a very serious uh, parasite. And uh, Hemuncus and tortoises develop resistance to basically all the classes of dewormers that are, that are available right now. It's important to understand the life cycle of the worms. Uh, the dewormers uh, treat the, uh, the adult which, is, which occurs in the animal. Um, so the adult is either in the abomasum or the small intestine or the large intestine and lays eggs. The eggs pass out of the animal on, onto the pasture and pass out in the feces. And under the right conditions, which we had a summer that was perfect for it here in Georgia of, of um, warm, moist conditions, the eggs hatch into larvae. And then the larvae go through several molts. Uh, the first two, the L1 and the L3, actually occur in the, the feces itself, so where they feed on bacteria. And then until they reach the infective stage, which is the L3, which um, actually doesn't feed, but it, but it has stored uh, nutrients. And it's just it's a very active, uh, para, very active larvae at this point. And it wiggles up and down and goes up and down with the dew on the grass. And the animal consumes the grass, uh, the larvae uh, migrate to the to the organ, the small intestine or the large int or the, the abomasum, go through several more molts and then gets uh, becomes a, a, a egg laying adult. And the, the whole process is then repeated. This is a picture of uh, Hemonchus contortus. Uh, this whole life cycle, as I say, takes only two and a half to three weeks under good conditions. And so you can have a very high infection level in less than a month um, here in Georgia and, and most places in the East Coast and even, as Dr. Getz said, even up into Canada during the summertime. You can see this, uh, this barber pole appearance, uh, uh, an old-fashioned barber pole that's uh, because of the, the blood in the intestine of the animal and it's wrapping around the, the white eggs in the, in the, um, the ovary. Humulcus contortus has this uh, stylet or lancet that it actually uses just uh, to basically pierce the, the lining of the stomach and it just kind of scrapes the lining and actually injects a type of anticoagulant. And so it starts uh, blood flowing and then it just feeds on the blood and absorbs it into its, uh, into its body. And so animals can become highly anemic in a very short period of time under a severe infection. And this uh, condition called bottle jaw is a swelling underneath the, um, the jaw. Uh, it's low, actually due to uh, low blood protein. And it's, um, this is an indication of an animal that's very heavily parasitized. Why is it such a problem? Uh, the parasite evolved in the tropics, so it thrives in warm, wet climates. In the south, it has a very long transmission season. Basically, you can have infected larvae on pasture year-round in the southern, southern U.S. It has a, a short life cycle, and so you know, within just three or four weeks, uh, pastures can reach, can reach quite dangerous levels of um, infection with humongous. Uh, unfortunately, immunity is slow to, to, to develop uh, to H. contortus infection in sheep and lambs uh, because they have uh, very little natural immunity or very highly susceptible. And even you, uh, the immunity of the you wanes around the time of lambing due to uh, stress. Uh, why is it such a problem? Each, if you look, it, it is a very prolific worm. And if you look at the numbers, each female can produce 5,000 eggs per day. If you have 500 worms, that's 2.5 million eggs per day per animal. And if you have 50 sheep, that's a billion eggs per week that are going to be infecting the pasture. Uh, the brown stomach worm uh, is more of a cool season 
uh, worm, and so it's the most important species of sheep and goats in cool climates, such as in uh, the northern U.S. Um, but that, that's that's even changing some now in the summertime, where uh, Haemonchus is becoming the dominant parasite even in these areas. Um, but this one, uh, the, the worms, it, it doesn't actually feed on blood. Uh, worms develop in the gastric glands and destroy the glands, which then affects the animal's appetite and its ability to di digest and absorb nutrients. And the symptoms of this are diarrhea and reduced appetite and weight loss. So uh, just as a quick overview, um, anthelmintics are commonly called dewormers or drenches. And there's actually only three classes of, of, you know, there's a lot of different drugs out there, but there's only um, three classes or families of anthelmintics that, and each class has a similar um, activity or a similar way of, of attacking the worm. Um, these drugs can be sold under many different trade names. And so a uh, selection can be quite confusing because it's, it, but it's normally the same drug. So uh, just as a brief um, overview, uh, one class is called the, the benzimidazoles. Uh, the main two types are fenbendazole, which is sold as Panicure or Safeguard. Uh, another is albendazole, which is sold as Valbazin. Um, there's the avermectin milbomycins, which are ivermectin, um, also, also uh, marketed as ivermec or moxidectin, which is marketed as cydectin. And then the third major class are the, are the membrane depolarizers, which include levamisole, which is marketed as tramisole, levisol, or prohibit, and then also morantal tartrate and parantal tartrate, which is marketed as rheumatil. One note uh, with, with levamisol, there are problems um, because of, uh, there's a rather na narrow margin of safety when you're using levamisol, and so it's actually important to get your animal's weight and not just you know, use the same level of dewormer in each of your animals. Um, you also don't want to withhold feed before you, you give it, and don't use it in uh, dehydrated animals. There's been a lot of uh, discussion about other potential dewormers. I'm sure you've heard of, of DE or diametaceous earth. Uh, there's a, a number of herbal dewormers that are on the market. Unfortunately, there's no uh, scientific evidence that these uh, have any benefit for worm control. Uh, we are still doing some research, but uh, so far we've not been able to find any uh, published scientific um, work that, that shows that, that they're actually effective. Well, let me come back in uh, at this point and uh, ask the question, how did we get here? And essentially, it's because we were doing what we thought was right based on what we knew at the time. And we also assumed that there would also, there would always be a new product come uh, uh, to be available. Uh, we also followed uh, what was recommended by the experts, the extension specialists, the veterinarians that were out there. So let's just take a few minutes to uh, revisit the uh, whole issue of uh, resistance and to um, consider some of the factors that were involved. If we take a look at uh, some of the things that uh, we did, the traditional approach involved treating the whole herd and deworming by the calendar. Those were the two primary uh, recommendations that were made uh, for many, many decades uh, that uh, worked actually to the detriment uh, and uh, created uh, the uh, resistance situation. We also rotated uh, dewormers uh, regularly, uh, at least once a year. Recommendation was to do that. And that was, again, was on the assumption that there would be new products come along when we needed them. In some cases, uh, it wasn't possible to rotate pastures. And so by having only one area for grazing, it made uh, the exposure to the larva quite a lot uh, greater. Uh, overgrazing, um, as with uh, any of the small ruminants, the uh, sheep are reproduced uh, fairly rapidly. It's easy to get in a situation where you're overgrazing more animals on an area than you originally anticipated or planned. And 
dewormed and it immediately moved animals to the new pasture. We know now that that was not a constructive thing to, to do. And so we um, also, um, uh, whenever we'd buy new breeding stock, uh, really essentially buying a population of worms, and turn them out into uh, our existing ewe flock, and they populated the, uh, the pastures. So then the um, question is, uh, what are the major causes of this resistance to the dewormers? And the big, uh, one of the really big ones is the lack of refugia. Now that's kind of a $50 word there, but uh, it actually has become a word that's used more prominently these days because of the genetic, genetically modified organisms that require uh, refugia in order to be effective. But refugia is simply defined as a portion of the worm population that is not selected uh, by the uh, drug treatment. In other words, these are worms that uh, exist in untreated animals. They're not exposed to the dewormer. Uh, and eggs and larvae that happen to be on the pasture, again, not exposed to a deworming event. And so uh, they are not selected um, uh, for by our treatment. So this refugia basically provides a pool of sensitive genes and dilutes the frequency of the resistant genes because of the fact that the worms um, interbreed and there is a dilution effect. Uh, many people considered uh, the presence of refugia to be the most important factor in uh, developing uh, uh, drug resistance. So as we move on then, let's take a, a, an additional look at some of the uh, causes of the resistance to dewormers. And one of the causes, one of the main causes is treatment strategies that decrease the number of worms in the refugia group. And this happens anytime we treat and immediately move to a clean pasture because what we end up doing is populating that clean pasture with resistant worms rather than a portion of susceptible worms. Uh, treating when there are a few larvae on the pasture. In other words, during a, a dry period of time, um, we'll go to deworm and uh, uh, it eliminates some of the refugia and then treating all the animals at the same time. There's no uh, refuge point there. Anytime you're treating your animals more than uh, three times a year, uh, you're working against the uh, reservoir of, of uh, susceptible worms. Important to um, be sure we're dosing with the correct um, uh, level. Oftentimes underdosing occurs when, we're, when we miss the mark on the weight of animals. It's not just a matter of filling the syringe, it's a matter of knowing accurately the weight of the animals that we're working on. So if resistance seems to be inevitable, what can we do? We first of all need to recognize the fact that resistance is a natural biological consequence of drug treatment. As I said before, anytime we treat, that's essentially a selection event for resistance. And the rate of development of this resistance uh, can be controlled uh, by what we do or what we don't do from a management standpoint. We can slow down the rate at which the uh, resistance occurs. So our goal as sheep producers, sheep owners, sheep advisors is to preserve the efficacy of the drugs that we have available for as long as possible. And we do that through two different ways. Increasing the, the um, amount of refugia that's out there and selective treatment. In other words, not treating all of the animals uh, all of the time. So um, it's important also to point out 
that uh, resistance occurs within classes of antithelmintics. In other words, if we have resistance to one drug in a class, essentially we have resistance to all of the drugs in the class, and the only difference between the drugs or the brand names within that class is the um, potency of the product. And there can be, because of that potency, there is a sequence in which one would use the products within a class. We have now determined that in some flocks, nothing works from the standpoint of a dewormer. Total anthelmintic failure. This first recognized in some work done by uh, Dr. Ray Kaplan at University of Georgia in 2005. Recently, in uh, some survey work, uh, it was determined that 17% of the farms in the southeastern United States uh, were experiencing total anthelmintic failure. This was uh, also validated in a recent uh, NOM sheep study that uh, confirmed what was happening as well. So what does this mean for the, the, the sheep industry as a whole? Well, it means that uh, we can no longer uh, think of dewormers as being a uh, cheap and simple input that we use to maximize productivity, and especially in the case of Pimonchus contortus, which um, can uh, cause a high level of mortality, not just uh, low productivity. So we uh, need to realize that these dewormers are extremely valuable and treat them as limited resources. Take a medically-based approach to um, uh, treatment of the worm population. So we want to, we want then to, uh, um, we need then to uh, think of the long view and the reality of the situation and reduce our dependence on some of the uh, drugs that uh, are available out there and that we have routinely used. In the next slide, uh, we um, need to consider the ways in which we can slow down this uh, resistance. If, it, if resistance is inevitable, then we have a, a charge to uh, slow it down, reduce the genetic selection for resistance, which means deworming less often with the uh, chemical dewormers, and maintaining a pool of the sensitive genes which would be in the refugia. In other words, we need to move from treating flocks to treating individuals. And for doing that, we have uh, developed a concept called smart drenching or integrated parasite management, IPM, um, in order to make this um, happen. And so I'm going to ask uh, Tom to uh, continue this discussion in regard to smart drenching and uh, what the uh, components of a smart drenching uh, program might be. Okay, thank you, Will. Um, when we're talking about smart drenching, we're talking about um, trying to come up with ways to intelligently use the, the remaining drugs that we have. You know, these, we're not saying don't use drugs. We're saying use them properly, use them wisely, and, and treat them as a very uh, limited but valuable resource. And, but the components of a smart drenching program, uh, you need to know uh, before you start what the resistance status of your flock actually is, uh, which drugs the, uh, the sheep are resistant to, uh, which ones they're not, um, or the, or the the, the parasites within the sheep, anyway. Um, you need to use appropriate pasture management to keep uh, resistant worms off the farm. Uh, be careful where you buy your animals, and just be aware of uh, of um, or use management, you know, to keep your animals isolated before you allow them on onto the farm. 
it's important to administer the proper dose of, you know, just by using a wrong dose, you can actually select for more parasites. And uh, we also utilize host physiology, things that we know about uh, uh, digestion, say the, the rate which, with which drugs go through the, the animal's body based upon uh, whether or not they've eaten, uh, the animal has eaten or not. And then uh, a very important tool, which is selective treatment, using uh, a concept called Famacha. So in order to know the resistance status of the flock, uh, there's essentially two ways. Uh, one is called a fecal egg count reduction test, um, which a farmer can do actually do on his own property if he has a, access to a, a microscope. Um, or to use a uh, what's called a drench right analysis, and I'll talk about that more in the next slide, but that, that's, that has to be done in the laboratory. And we recommend now that, uh, that a farmer repeats this every two years because it's development of resistance can happen that quickly. And so um, when you know what resistance you have, uh, the drug can still be used, but it has to be managed appropriately. So what is a fecal egg count reduction test? Uh, this, uh, you can do this with your own animals. Take random fecal samples from about 10 animals and then um, deworm you know, with whatever product you're testing. Uh, take a fecal sample from the same 10 animals in 7 to 10 days and then look under the microscope, either have a vet do it or, or do it uh, yourself. Determine the level of decrease in uh, number of eggs per gram of feces. And the reduction should be 90 to 95 percent if the drug is still working. If it's actually less than 95 percent, it's considered that you have a resistance to that drug. Um, this can be, as we said, done uh, on farm, whereas this, uh, the drench right procedure is a laboratory procedure. Um, as far as pasture management, we encourage uh, farmers to use appropriate stocking rates, don't overgraze, uh, build temporary or permanent fences in order to provide safe pastures or you can move animals into a, uh, a pasture away from areas where there's a high concentration of, of larvae. You can also use dilution strategies by, by mixing two or more livestock species on the same pasture. Uh, sheep and goats don't, uh, don't share the same parasites as cattle or horses. And so by adding cattle or horses to your sheep, uh, the cattle pick up the, the parasites and it doesn't hurt the cattle, but it, but it helps the sheep. Uh, we, we recommend rotating pastures, pastures between the different species of, of sheep or cattle. Um, but don't try to do it uh, combining sheep and goats because uh, they, all, they share the same parasites and so it doesn't work in that instance. Generally avoid overstocking. Um, it's hard to, to give really um, for an audience such as this one any kind of, of uh, ballpark figures for stocking, but um, just as a general rule, uh, five to eight sheep equals a, a, an animal unit, and so if you're more familiar with stocking for cattle, um, you know, one cow is generally a one animal unit, and so um, if you're stocking for, for cattle, keep that in mind for sheep. But uh, uh, generally, fewer is often better because it, it reduces exposure. That the more animals you have in an area, the more they're going to uh, drop feces, and the more larvae, and the more uh, exposure those animals are going to have to, to larvae. It's always better uh, to have some browse rather than grazing because the, the larvae are at at ground level, they're in the feces, and so they're generally going to be within two to four inches of the ground. And so if you have uh, some browse areas, uh, your animals will be eating their feed up away from the ground, which reduces exposure to worm larvae. It also provides a diversity in the diet, uh, some secondary metabolites such as tannins, which can help with parasites as well. Uh, it may limit energy and um, but protein levels often, can often be high with these uh, growing points and young leaves and so forth in, in uh, trees. Pasture rotation, if it's possible, uh, is, is just 
it's it's an important consideration, not so much um, more from a nutri nutrition standpoint. Uh, there's there's not a whole lot of evidence in our environment that uh, rotating pastures helps from a parasite standpoint um, in the animal, but it does help with the animal's nutrition, which helps which helps them deal with parasites. Uh, it's important to um, keep animals away or fence them away from uh, risky areas or just be, be aware uh, where these areas are. Uh, it's essentially where, anywhere where animals congregate, uh, where you can have increased fecal egg count uh, contamination or increased fecal contamination. And so essentially what you're doing is, is if you have minerals or water or shade, you're increasing the relative stocking rate around those, uh, those areas. And so they can become problem areas. Uh, as a general rule, you need to be aware um, of where you're buying your animals and you don't try not to buy resistant worms. Uh, so all new additions to the flock should be quarantined and aggressively dewormed uh, upon arrival to your farm. We recommend, uh, by aggressive, we say combine all the different anthematics that you have from different drug classes such as uh, combining moxidectin with, with levamisole or albendazole and try to essentially remove all the parasites in the animal. Keep it in quarantine for uh, up to, to 14 days and also to, to perform a fecal egg count test to confirm that, that it's not shedding eggs. We also recommend that you place the animal onto contaminated pasture rather than onto um, uncontaminated pasture so that it'll, it will uh, begin to pick up some, some susceptible parasites. It's very important to, root, to use the proper technique when you're deworming um, to ensure that the proper dose is delivered. Uh, for the, the proper technique is uh, putting the drench over the back of the tongue. If you don't do this, uh, sometimes the, um, there's a esophageal groove that can close and the, and the the drug will go straight to the abomasum and will not spend enough time in the animal to, uh, to be effective. Um, yeah, so in that case, then efficacy is reduced. Give the right dose. It's important to know uh, the way of the animal is being tested. Um, all of these different drugs have different uh, concentrations, and so you can't just give the same one to, you know, the same level to each animal. It is a good idea to have uh, weigh scales. If you can just, such as in, in this uh, photograph where they're it's set up, the animal can, can go right in and, and you can just keep, keep tabs of their weight. Uh, you can use uh, weight tapes, uh, which are effective for sheep and dairy goats, but uh, less effective for, for meat goats. Um, you going to jump in here? Okay, I, I was going to let uh, Dr. Getz uh, jump back in here to take over for a minute. Well, there are a few uh, additional things that you can do to uh, maximize the drug efficacy, and one of those is to restrict the feed uh, for 24 hours prior to treatment. And what this does is that it decreases the digestion that happens to be in the digestive tract, uh, allows the uh, uh, dewormer to have more contact with the uh, lining of the uh, digestive tract and increases the drug efficacy. Obviously, you don't want to do this in late pregnancy because those ewes are trying to get um, all the energy that they need to support the fetuses in late pregnancy. They need to eat uh, all of the time, have their head down uh, into the grazing resource, um, and they don't need to be without feed for 24 hours. And then uh, repeat the, door, the, the dose in 12 hours. Uh, this uh, tends to increase the efficacy of the dewormer uh, beyond uh, the single treatment that might happen to be there. Uh, there is obviously a genetic, uh, uh, there are genetic differences among uh, different animals within a flock and among different breeds within the, within the species. We need to probably uh, take a moment to uh, distinguish between what we call resilience, which is the ability of uh, individual or groups of sheep 
to cope with heavy worm challenges as compared to true resistance, which is the ability of the sheep to limit the establishment of a worm population, worm infection within their body. Um, either one of those is a um, positive uh, attribute that we're looking um, for. And uh, by, um, by looking at individual animals, uh, as we will explain later on, the way to define there. Obviously, the sire will have an influence because of the genetic uh, composition uh, for resilience or resistance. And as I said before, there can be some, uh, there is some variation uh, among as well as within breeds. It's possible for any breed to become more resistant to the challenges of worms if the breeders choose to do so. Obviously, good nutrition is a key factor. Animals that uh, are well fed, have nutrient uh, balanced, um, and most of the time this is going to come off of uh, forage and, and pasture, are much able, much better able to withstand challenges of a parasite uh, uh, infection that's there. Um, Obviously, there's an interaction between uh, nutrition and, and genetics and the uh, level of performance that is expected. Good nutrition is a, a key to overall health and uh, growth rate. And uh, this is true regardless of the product that you are uh, in, um, involved with. There been a number of studies that show that uh, Sheep that are provided uh, adequate protein and have a, an appropriate energy protein uh, ratio stand a better chance of fighting off these uh, parasites. So um, within the matter of uh, nutrition, uh, we know that even within what might be called resistant breeds, if those animals are in, uh, under poor nutrition, low uh, energy, low protein, they're going to have a, a greater challenge in dealing with these parasites. And obviously, even within breeds that may be more susceptible, if they're on an excellent diet, they're going to be able to withstand the uh, challenge better. So the question comes up, <clears throat> and we talked about the issue of uh, rotating uh, dewormers. Uh, in some cases, this is a good idea. And it was an idea that was promoted for many years, uh, but uh, it's uh, not a replace, not a replacement uh, for proper resistant uh, prevention measures in, in other ways. It's not going to make the problem go uh, go away. Uh, in many farms, rotation of the anthelmintic is not possible because there's already a level of resistance against uh, some of the options that are out there. Rotation of uh, dewormers is uh, a bad idea in the next slide, you'll see, because it creates a, a false sense of presumption that uh, the resistance prevention program is, in fact, uh, working. Uh, rotation will tend to mask the development of resistance until uh, we reach a point where you have multiple drugs for which the parasites are resistant. In some cases, uh, it's uh, recommended that drug combinations be used. We'll not go into any detail on that. Uh, if you want more details, you can uh, uh, get that uh, yourself. So we move on through uh, the issue of selective uh, treatment. This is essentially where we make decisions about, about uh, either treating or not treating individual animals. And the protocol that we're going to be visiting with you about applies uh, for Haemonchus contortus only, because it is a blood-sucking worm. Uh, the, uh, the result is severe anemia. And uh, the tool that we're going to visit with you about uh, depends on that being a factor for other uh, worms, 
you need to consider utilizing the fecal egg count, the age, body condition, uh, the production level, uh, and um, weight gain as indicators of whether or not those other worms are a problem. <clears throat> body condition score uh, is, um, is a tool that helps uh, not only with the Haemonchus contortus, but especially with some of the other gastrointestinal worms. Um, as a measure of that. In the next slide, you'll be able to see here a chart, which is uh, uh, instructive. And it basically says that 20 to 30 percent of the animals in our flock are going to be responsible for most of the resistance that we see in that flock. And you will notice here that as you look at that curve, uh, the number of sheep within a flock out there to the right um, number of worms, uh, you look at the 20 to 30 percent out there, they have most of the worms. And so it's the, the uh, infection frequency of these worms is not equal throughout the flock. So what we're trying to do is to find those 20 or 30 percent and deal with them. And we're going to do that individually. So how easy is it to determine uh, who to treat and who not to treat? especially in regard to Haemonchus contortus. Well, Tom is going to tell you uh, how to do that. Take it away, Tom. Thank you, uh, Will. Uh, this truly was not possible until about 20 years ago with uh, some veterinarians in South Africa came up with something called the, the Famacha system. And Famacha is, was actually named after a, a fellow named Fafa Milan, and so the acronym comes from uh, Fafa Milan's chart, Fafa Cha. The system is based on, okay, it's it's a very simple system. It's just a, a laminated chart, laminated card with different colors. It's an eye color chart with five different color categories, um, from red, which is healthy, to white, which is severely anemic. Um, since the primary impact of infection with H. contortus is anemia, you can indirectly measure the parasite burden by measuring anemia. But uh, with just a reminder that uh, um, it's only useful in areas where Haemonchus contortus is the primary parasite species. But since it's becoming the primary species, in, even in the summertime as far north as Canada and, and now even up into Scandinavia, it's got, it's got a very widespread uh, usefulness. Um, just a quick definition of anemia is uh, it's a reduction below a normal in the number or, or volume of red blood cells in the blood. Um, symptoms depend on the degree or severity of the, of the anemia. Uh, if you have lost a lot of blood, uh, one symptom is what's called submandibular edema or bottle jaw, that uh, swelling under the jaw. Um, you can also uh, combine this with un un unthrifty condition, which is, uh, can be determined by, by poor body condition scoring. Um, and it leads to exercise and heat intolerance. Uh, animals don't move very well, and they have very pale <coughs> mucous membranes. And this is uh, just an example of, of what the, the mucous membrane of a, of a severely anemic animal is. This one's lost most of its blood. And the, the, the sheep on the left has the condition of uh, bottle jaw. Just a little bit about Haemonchus contortus. A heavy burden can result in the loss of <coughs> half a cup or more of blood per day. Um, the total blood volume that makes up approximately one twelfth of the total body weight, so you can uh, lose as much as 50% of blood loss in a little over a month. And so an animal can go from healthy to essentially bleeding to death on the pasture in a very short period of time. As I said, this. Um, just by looking at the lower eyelid and comparing it to the color on the chart, you can determine if the animal needs to be dewormed or if it's heavily infected. If it's uh, a one or a two category that's red or red pink, then it doesn't need deworming. If it's three, it's borderline, it's uh, pink. If it's pink, white, or white, uh, it has a four or five, then it, uh, it needs deworming. And the hematocrit range on the right is the, is the d determination of uh, laboratory determination of the percentage of, of red and white blood cells. 
this is how it's actually done. You just uh, pull down on the eyelid and place some gentle pressure on the upper eyelid, and that pops out this uh, area of the mucous membrane. You do it rapidly uh, so that it doesn't uh, have time to, to change color, and you just pull it down and, and compare it to the color on the chart. Let me uh, interject something at this point. Uh, in, the, in the interest of time, we're going to skip some of the uh, additional slides that uh, will be available to you uh, through ASI, and uh, we've given a yeah, we've given a, a good overview, I think, of the chemical situation, and we want to move now actually to uh, some of the uh, uh, newer methods uh, that uh, the consortium has been working with, and uh, uh, to tell you a little bit about that. I would say that by keeping accurate records of uh, the individual animals, those that are treated, those that are not treated, and how often they're treated, uh, creates a good uh, database for making selection decisions. So what we're going to do then is uh, to move forward. Uh, we can select individuals that are resistant and call susceptible individuals based on this Amacha information. And um, it's a long-term process, but you'll be surprised how uh, much uh, difference it makes when you first start getting rid of those that are retreat, repeated uh, animals for treatment. Uh, another uh, new um, method or alternative method to drugs is giving animals copper oxide wire, particle, wire particles. Uh, this has been shown to be effective against humongous, but it's only humongous. Um, it was originally marketed for use in cattle, uh, something called copper shore. Um, but it, it works very well in uh, in sheep, but um, there's yeah, there is potential for toxic effects, and so you have to be careful not to use too many, um, not to do, to use it to deworm um, too many times. Um, it is effective in goats, but it's a little more variable variable than in sheep. And we just as uh, with, with using drugs, we recommend selective treatment, uh, only using it of, of animals that need it, based upon uh, determination of their level of parasites based on pharmacia. Another uh, thing that we've done a lot of work on is use of condensed tannin-containing plants, and particularly one called Ceresia lespedeza. And this is a forage that go, grows uh, quite well in the southeastern U.S. Um, it's established as a pasture uh, or a hay, in, um, but, but it's also uh, can, be, can be made into pellets. And it's very effective against humongous. Um, other types of tannin-containing um, extracts have also been used, but uh, so far have not been uh, nearly as, as effective as, uh, as the work with Ceresia lespedeza. So I'm, I was just going to focus a little bit on that. This is a, a picture of the plant. It's a uh, older farmers will, will recognize it. It's, uh, it was called poor man's alfalfa because it grows on very uh, acid soils and uh, grows with, with very little fertilizer. It's a perennial warm season legume that's high in something called condensed tannins, which is a secondary compound of, of plants that actually binds to protein. And as I said, it's tolerant of low pH and grows on infertile soils. Uh, this is the area in the U.S. Uh, where it grows most, uh, grows very well. It also grows in other parts of the world. It grows extremely well in southern Africa and uh, actually came from, from China and India, and so it grows well in that area, too. Um, there, we've done a lot of uh, research here at Fort Valley uh, looking at different forms of Ceresia. Uh, one of the claims to fame of Ceresia is that it makes excellent hay because it dries very, very quickly. And then, um, so we've looked at ground hay, um, leaf meal, and also pellets. And just as a summary of the, all the work that's been done so far, um, of the effectiveness of, and this is actually adult worm species, um, and normally you have to feed it for about six weeks to get this level of control. But Humuncus, there was about a 70% reduction. Um, it has also had some, some effect against Trichostrondulus and Ostrotasia. But for a biological um, treatment, that's, that's, that's a very uh, 
promising, uh, almost as much as an anthelmintic. Some of the research results of the optimum dietary level for reducing effects appears to be about 50 to 75 percent. And so you need to get that much into the animal uh, from a parasite standpoint. And we're still working out uh, from a dietary and nutrition standpoint what's the optimum level. Uh, pelleting, when you pellet feed, it, uh, you have to heat it. And we thought that this would actually reduce the efficacy, but it, it did not. And so that, that uh, pellets were just as effective against uh, parasitic nematodes as the, as the hay. Um, it also in, in increased animal performance in a study we did here at Fort Valley in growing goats. Copper oxide wire particles um, are these little filings, uh, just look like uh, copper rods. Oops. Oh, this this is the effect of copper oxide are uh, of, of giving this bolus to to sheep. Again, it's only effective mainly against Haemonchus contortus, but uh, um, you know, you can get 70, 80 percent kill of adult worms uh, just by using this, this product. And it was originally developed, uh, the 25 gram bolus that you see on the right was developed for cattle that were, uh, that had copper deficiency. And um, initially we would just repackage it into, into one gram or, or half gram size to give to, to sheep or goats. And, but now there's actually uh, some commercially available in the smaller sizes. What we recommend generally is that you, um, rather than just depending on, on one type of, of um, deworming practice, that you develop an integrated program uh, combining different things. And we're, we've been doing research. Uh, that was one by uh, Dr. Burke, uh, our, our colleague at a USDA station in Arkansas, combining uh, copper oxide wire particles uh, plus Fomachat to identify the animals that needed it, uh, plus feeding a Ceresia pellet as a supplement on pasture. And this is just an example of some integrated uh, control programs that have been successfully employed by various farmers. Um, Arkansas sheep breeder was combining famacha and copper oxide wire particles. Um, Tennessee goat producer was combining famacha with rotational grazing of browse plus supplemental cerecia lespidiza hay. And then an Ohio sheep breeder was combining famacha with genetic selection and rotational grazing to maintain refugia. And so this is uh, a much better way, you know, on your farm to find out what's, what's most effective to try different combinations of things. Should we go on with this? Okay. Uh, just very quickly, some of, the, some of the early work that we did, there was a type of, of nematode trapping fungi. It was called Dun Dunningtonia flagrans. Um, it's actually, um, it was highly effective. It would actually trap the, the developing larvae in the feces and use it as a feed source. But the problem with this is that it's the company that was making this, this uh, fungus and making it commercially available uh, went out of business. And so even though it is effective, it's not uh, currently available, even though some are continuing to do some research uh, because it is quite promising. We've also done, done some research with uh, vaccines against Haemonchus contortus. We found that it works quite well in controlling parasites in sheep and goats. But the drawback is that the, uh, the vaccination has to be done quite frequently, um, that the, the protection is not complete. It's also expensive. And uh, so right now, this, uh, both the, the vaccines and the fungus are, are not really commercially available. I think, uh, again, in the interest of time and to allow a little bit of time for discussion, we're going to move on through uh, the rest of these uh, particular slides and summarize uh, many of the things that we've talked about. Uh, and essentially, internal parasite management in sheep is we have the potential for it to be more effective and sustainable because we understand not only the parasites but the uh, sheep uh, better than we have in the past. Uh, we'd also direct your attention to two other uh, resources uh, on this particular subject, especially uh, the website for the uh, Parasite Consortium, as well as the uh, e-extension website with the Sheep Community of Practice, which also maintains information on uh, internal parasite 
management. And with that, uh, we'll wrap up uh, our comments. And Jay, if you want to take over now and uh, okay. uh, moderate the uh, questions, uh, that's fine. Okay. Excellent, guys. And uh, we have uh, several people that have typed in questions during the presentation, which I'll go ahead and just take those in the order they were entered in because they look like excellent questions. I do also want to tell our listeners that if you want to ask your question directly and you have a microphone hooked up to your computer or you uh, phoned in and put in your PIN number, uh, if you click the little hand guy uh, that should be showing on your uh, uh, screen there, there's a little hand there where you can raise your hand, uh, I can call on you uh, directly and you can uh, unmute your microphone and let you ask the question direct. Um, but let's go ahead and get started with some of the ones that were uh, sent in during the presentation. Um, let's see, let's start with uh, Rudd sent in a question that asked about uh, do parasite, do resistant parasites move between individual animals and if so at how significant a rate? Can you repeat that again? Uh, do resistant parasites move between individual animals? And if so, at how significant a rate was the question? I assume you're talking about the different uh, parasite uh, species that are out there? Yeah. Uh, any individual animals can have more than one of the species. And uh, all of those species uh, will be um, out in the environment uh, to one extent or another. And so you'll have, uh, uh, you'll have, uh, you can have each of the species uh, existing in the GI tract of individual animals. And what we've been suggesting is that uh, you need to determine uh, early on which of those species is really the problem one on your particular farm or in your particular flock. One, one animal can't, can't catch a parasite or a resistant parasite from another, what it does is um, those resistant parasites seed the pasture. And then, you know, the, any animal is grazing, so it's, you know, each of your, your parasite, each of your animals that has resistant parasites will seed the pasture, and then those resistant parasites will be available to whatever animal grazes it. Okay. So it's, it's not a direct um, Thing, but and it, it, it takes time, but uh, it can it can happen rather relatively quickly. Okay, very good. I'm going to combine a couple of questions here because Justin asked why is rotating paddocks not effective at reducing parasite loads, and then Laura asked how long does it take for parasites to die off on a pasture, or do they remain dormant for a period of time? And I suspect your answer might be interrelated there between those two. So. I'll take a first stab at that. The rotating pastures uh, is effective in reducing the uh, level of exposure of the sheep to the parasites that are out there. Uh, we didn't mean to imply that rotation was not effective. It is effective uh, to some degree. It depends on how fast you rotate. Uh, it's uh, been uh, suggested that just purely from an internal parasite standpoint, a grazing, a grazing area would need to be free of sheep or free of goats for at least uh, uh, six months or so to have a meaningful uh, or a major impact in decreasing the parasite uh, population. That doesn't mean that it can't be used because it can be used by other livestock species. It can be used for hay, um, other uses. Uh, but um, purely from a parasite standpoint, it would need to be idle for uh, a rather long period of time. But definitely rotation uh, is helpful in reducing the level of exposure. Okay. The reason that I'm, I mentioned that uh, in, in this, in most of the environments in the U.S. Um, is because there's rarely do we get just a just a continual flush of of all of the of the larvae coming out at one time. And so, particularly if you have a drier year, they'll just sit out there and then wait for rain. And 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 so, um, if you if you're trying to rotate, you know, 
to just time it for when all the larvae have come out. It's very challenging to do in our environment. And that, that's why I said it's, it's, it doesn't always work. But, but it does help from the standpoint of pasture management and giving a better nutrition to the animal, which allows it to fight the parasites off better. Okay. And Margie asked a question, uh, are we counting on the dewormers being absorbed in the rumen, reticulum, and omasin, and thus do not want it to get dumped straight into the location of the adult parasites, the abomasin? Does this also indicate we might want an injectable over a drench to obtain a greater systemic effect? Well, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm not a vet, but I can, I can <laughs> take a stab at my, uh, at my understanding of it. And um, the effectiveness of, of any drug is going to be dependent on how long the parasite is, is uh, in contact with the drug. And so if it goes, if it, you know, when it goes into the rumen, it takes longer for the drug to, to go through the animal system. And so there's a longer period of exposure uh, between the drug and the parasite. And if you just... You know, if it just, just goes straight into the abomasum, it would go out very quickly, and it wouldn't be there long enough to be as effective. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons that, uh, that we say physiologically, if you uh, hold an animal without feed overnight, you actually slow down the, the flow of, of feed, and so that would slow, that would slow down or lengthen the, the time that, that the drug has contact with the parasite you know, as it goes through the animal system. But as far as the difference between a, uh, injectable, um, so I'm, I'm not really qualified to answer that one. Okay. And Cody has asked a question, are the three classes of anthelminics only available worldwide or only approved in the United States? So I guess it's just where all is that available? They, most of them are available worldwide. Um, and pr people have probably heard about a new class that's been available, um, it's called Zolvix, uh, but it's, uh, it's been available in New Zealand and Australia and places like that, but it's currently not available in the U.S. And, you know, they're, they're saying that it may become available at some point. But uh, what we caution everybody um, is that even with these new classes of drugs is that they'll be very expensive because it'll be one of the few things that works. And it... it there's already resistant worms out there to it, and it won't, you know, if we continue doing what we've always done, you know, go back to old practices of deworming all the animals at one time, deworming them, you know, every month and things like that, then we will, you know, fairly rapidly develop resistance to any new drugs that, that come onto the market. Okay. But that, that, that particular one is not, is not currently available in the U.S. Okay. And I'm going to combine another couple of questions because they both have to do with the pellets. Uh, Justin asked where you buy the Cerechia uh, Lespendiza pellets, and then somebody else asked about the rate at which you feed them. Um, they are commercially available now, um, and I believe, I don't know if it's listed on our website, but it's a, uh, a company called Sims Brothers Seed Company in Union Springs, Alabama. And uh, they, they have made a pellet based on Ceresia leaf meal. Uh, they found a way to, to uh, separate the, the leaves and just make the pellet based on the, it's, I think it's 90% leaf meal plus a, plus a binder. And so um, I believe there's information uh, on Sims Brothers uh, Seed Company on our website. But uh, uh, they have a web. Yep. Sims Brothers also has a website themselves, yep. so you can go there directly. It's one word, S-I-M-S -S Brothers, um, and then Seed Company. And so I, th I think it's simsbrothers.com. Okay. And what was your other question? Oh, that the amount? Yeah. Um, we, we've found effectiveness when we feed it at, at about a pound per head per day. And... Um, you know, we're, we're doing a study right now where we're going to go lower than that, and just to see, because uh, just this past year we we found it to be quite effective against coccidia, as well as these uh, these parasites, in both sheep and goats. And so we're we're doing a study to see if we can go lower, uh, you know, how low in the diet we can actually go to, um, to still get the effectiveness. And so we need to repeat the question in in about six months. Okay. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to combine a couple of other questions on the COWP. Uh, Roy asks, how long uh, 
are they effective? And Cody asks, where does one buy it? Um, the, the work that we've seen is that, uh, I mean, they can be effective up to, up to about eight weeks, uh, six to eight weeks, something like that. And then, uh, um, but we don't, we caution you if you have sheep that um, not to, not to treat more than twice and to, we've, we've essentially found uh, the, the research that we've done that uh, you can get by with a, with a half gram sample and, you know, rather than one gram or two gram sample, and get a similar level of, of effectiveness. And um, our colleague, uh, Dr. Joan Burke, has done quite a bit of work on this, and that's her recommendation with that. But uh, um, there, there is a commercially available uh, one um, in Texas, I believe it is. I mean, if, if you just Google um, copper, copper oxide wire particle uh, for parasite control, uh, there's, there's a place called Ultra, Ultra Cruise Animal Health, and I was looking at uh, some of the boluses here right now. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. I, I should, I'm not supposed to be promoting different products, and so. Well, but, but they are available <laughs> if, if you Google Google them, because uh, um, we we haven't actually tested these yet. So that, the, the ones that have been <laughs> that have been tested as effective are are the, the Copasure. One of, one of the things to keep in mind is that this is a tool that's uh, most useful for young growing animals, uh, those that uh, ultimately will probably end up going to market. Uh, as uh, lambs grow and develop, they begin to develop uh, uh, some resistance to these worms, and therefore uh, these are not products that you would necessarily use on a lifetime basis, primarily uh, after weaning. Uh, young growing animals when they're most susceptible, then it can be a useful tool. And there's sort of a logical limit to how long you would use it uh, in those cases. Okay. Rogers asked, uh, once an animal is dewormed, how long in days does it take for the animal to be affected again? Well, that's sort of a loaded question because yeah. <laughs> it's uh, influenced uh, a lot by the um, level of... Um, of contamination of a pasture, and so if if the sheep go right back into a highly contaminated uh, situation, uh, then they're going to uh, be uh, exposed to that challenge, and um, we'll we'll have some problems relatively rapidly. Whereas if they go into a situation where it's uh, not as uh, intensively contaminated then it will take uh, a little bit longer. And I might just say one word, uh, a couple of instances we said that it's not wise to deworm and put the animals immediately into a, a new paddock. And the reason for that is that really you want them to be able to pick up some of those susceptible worms and then carry them to the new, to the new paddock or the clean paddock so that essentially you're sowing you're sowing um, susceptible worms in that paddock. Basically, you want to maintain a population of susceptible worms. Okay, Kathy asked a question related to that because she said, "How long uh, should you wait before you turn it, after worming before you turn them out on new pasture?" Uh, so, is there a time? You said that about not turning directly out there. We, generally, we would suggest three three days to a week. A period of about like that. Okay. Um, question from Amy. She asks if llamas are are llamas susceptible to the same parasites? Yes, and it's a big, big problem in the camelid industry, both llamas and alpacas. It's a big concern to those folks. Same problem, and uh, the same uh, practice of. Uh, deworming often and uh, regular. Yeah, we, we've documented uh, uh, that there is resistance uh, in camelid parasites, and they're, like you say, very similar parasites to goats and sheep. Um, there's resistance to the to the drugs that they're using there as well, and but the same tools, uh, farmers can also be used with camelids. Hmm. Okay. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, Don wants to know where a person can get a FAMACHA card. That's a good question, and it's a question that comes up a lot. The FAMACHA cards are uh, available uh, in connection with uh, training programs. Um, it's uh, important for people to get uh, appropriate training in how to use uh, uh, the FAMACHA card and to understand the whole process. And so um, uh, they need to make arrangements to get uh, trained uh, either by a veterinarian or by extension specialists agriculture teachers in the uh, state where they are uh, on the website, the consortium website uh, tells uh, who to contact in order to uh, get the cards following the training. Um, you can email either one of us as well and we'll provide that information to you also. Okay, very good. Uh, Don has asked if you guys would be willing to address uh, in uh, use an injectable ivermectin for worm control uh, versus drenching for worm control. Better, worse? Do you have opinions either way, or, or what are the things to look for there? The, parasito the parasitologist amongst us uh, pretty much all the time recommend uh, uh, drenching, uh, oral treatment drenching, uh, basically uh, because of the uh, physiology of the, the animals and the metabolism. Uh, you stand less of a chance to develop uh, resistance in the worms with a uh, uh, an oral product, a drench product, rather than injectable. Okay. And Christine asks, how frequently do copper oxide particle boluses have to be given? Um, I think we we mentioned you know maybe once every. Uh, six to six, six, yeah, six to eight weeks. Six to eight weeks, but you know that's also um, when you're doing any of these things, and we want to emphasize that nothing is done in isolation, and that you know whether whether it's a, a drug or, or um, feeding Lespedeza pellets or feeding the using the copper or whatever, is to combine it with famacha and only use it with the animals that um, that need it. And so, you know, just kind of routinely during the worm season, we recommend that you check your animals frequently with famacha, you know, so that that's, um, and if you find you're having to deworm the same animal over and over, you know, then you can call that animal or whatever. But, uh, you know, we don't recommend just using, you know, every six weeks or every eight weeks unless it's actually necessary. You know, it, it may well be that uh, that the animal can go longer or, some instances shorter, whatever, if they're more susceptible. And so you know, everything we do is based upon uh, you know, being aware of which, which animals need treatment. And that FAMACHA card is so useful for that. And it's a, it's a very simple thing to do. And, and we recommend that with, with any of these other um, treatments. OK. Um, let's see, uh, Linda wants to know, when using a half gram or gram dose of the COWP on lambs between two and six months old, how long might it take to develop copper toxicity? We hope it never develops. Um, <clears throat> because of the fact that uh, copper oxide is uh, not particularly available uh, to the animal itself, we're looking at the effects on the parasite. Uh, we feel like it's uh, relatively safe. Um, I don't think that uh, we have really run into uh, copper toxicity with that product uh, in any of our research work that, that we know of. Okay. There is some evidence of buildup of, uh, of you know, higher copper levels in liver, but uh, so far, um, we've not seen any any signs of toxicity, and, but it is something that's that uh, uh, sheep owners need to be aware of, and, and that's why we, we don't recommend more than treating more than twice um, in a year or whatever with with copper. Okay, you, get, you guys okay with just a couple more questions here? Uh, of course, yes, sir. Jerry asks about feeding the sarika pellets. Um, she's saying. Um, she assumes that that's in addition to the regular sheep feed, the, the uh, amount that you had given earlier that 
you don't reduce the regular feed because you're feeding that, or how do you handle that? Well, it is a, a feed, and, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, um, and that, that's one of the unique things about Ceresia is that you, know, you can replace some of whatever else they're on with uh, with the Ceresia pellets. You know, it's, you know, the, the leaf meal, it's, it's about 15% fruit protein, something like that, 14.5%, uh, and, and so um, whatever else you're, you're feeding, you can replace some of it with uh, with the less fedita. and so... Um, Okay. That's that's you know it is a feed, so that's that's one of its advantages. Okay, and last question is from Laura. It has to do with the uh, membranes. How long should it take the membranes to get red again after deworming? That's a very good question, and that can be a very frustrating thing, especially on sheep that uh, are highly uh, infected, and you're anxious whether they're going to survive at all. But uh, we found that it takes. Um, at least a week to 10 days to change uh, one score on that Famacha card. Uh, so it's not a rapid uh, process. Uh, essentially the sheep has to rebuild the blood and uh, increase the volume as well as increase the, uh, the uh, density um, of the blood and that takes time. So we're looking at seven to ten days uh, to move um, uh, to move back uh, one score. I would say maybe even a little bit longer but uh, just because a lot of that depends on the animal's nutrition. You know if they're if they're on poor pasture or something like that then they won't respond nearly as quickly and that's, that's where the, the combination of nutrition and everything else you do uh, comes in. Um, you know, if even a low level of parasites can can uh, keep an animal anemic if it's uh, if it's not well fed. Okay, very good. And I want to thank uh, both Will and Tom for their excellent presentation this evening. Just packed full of uh, a lot of information. Um, want to tell our listeners that it will it has been recorded and it will be posted and, and available for you to listen to. Um, and digest a little further. Uh, in addition, we'll uh, be making their uh, PowerPoint slides available uh, for viewing online, um, and you'll be receiving an email to that effect in within the next two days. It'll have links to that information. And uh, I want to remind everybody that we do have a couple of more webinars coming up. Our next one will be on September the 10th, and we'll have uh, Dr. Nancy Earlbeck of Colorado State University speaking on that one. Uh, her title is Feeding and Producing Sheep for Maximum Fiber Production. So for those of you out there that are uh, focused on wool production, you'll find that very interesting. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, draw this uh, webinar to a close. I appreciate everybody's patience this evening and the excellent questions that came in, and I hope you uh, found this uh, webinar very useful. And once again, thank you to uh, Will and Tom uh, for your excellent presentation. Thanks a lot, Jay. You're welcome. Okay.